this list in our number 10 spot, we have Hira C. Okay, I can admit when I'm wrong, and in the last video last week, I messed up. I said the wrong word when talking about spoiled queens. You guys pointed it out, yeah? I read your comments, okay? And now we're here to redeem ourselves. I'm learning, you're already smart, let's get into it. In medieval times, it could be dangerous to disagree. Nowadays, many people like to keep an open mind. There's so many cultures, beliefs, people think different things, and that is totally okay. But it absolutely was not okay in the Dark Ages. Oh no. In these times, if you held any kind of belief that could go against the teaching of the Christian church, you were seen as a heretic. Many leaders, whether kings or crusaders or even missionaries and merchants, especially from the late 11th century, fought to have Christianity take over in the Mediterranean world. People belonging to other faiths, such as Jewish and Muslim people, suffered persecution and expulsion. In England, there were massacres, and in the late 12th century, Edward I banned all Jewish people from England. I mean, this quite literally set the stage for the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, which was aimed at establishing Spain as a united single. Christian faith. Wars in medieval Europe weren't just waged on people of different faiths, however, it was also aimed at some Christians who people believed to be heretics. This is all to say that heresy was a serious crime in these times, and thinking outside of what you were told to think at the time and what was accepted could have landed you a death sentence. Number 9. Facial Expressions I can't grow facial hair. I'm not sure if you noticed that watching, but it's never happened. It's not gonna happen, quite frankly. I don't have to worry about trimming a beard early in the morning, anything like that, which is fine, to be honest with you. I can't, I'm not really complaining. Back in the medieval ages, I would have been set. People would have been pretty, I don't know, would have been more than ideal. The no hair look was the way to do it. The forehead was seen as the central point of your face, so it was common back in the medieval times for individuals to pluck all of their eyelashes and remove their eyebrows completely. So people would just be looking at you like, nothing going on, no facial expressions, just bald everything. Many would go as far as to pluck their hairline back even further so they have the round, oval, queen bald look. Imagine that. Imagine everyone's bald in Game of Thrones. Think it'd still get the rankings that it does? Probably not. Probably not. Macy Williams is just... In our number eight spot today, we have Animal Court. The history of animals being put on trial goes back pretty far, as it is believed it has roots in ancient Athens, but it was definitely a common practice as recently as the 18th century. Courts would go after things like rats, weevils, flies, locusts, and serpents for damaging crops, and when punished, they weren't just liable for damages, they could be banished and excommunicated. Like, imagine trying to banish a fly. This isn't where it ends, though. In civil criminal court, they'd have livestock being tried for violent against humans. Like, I'm sorry, your honor, my client could not tell the prosecution that she didn't want to be milked because she's a cow. Kicking was the only way. As an example of a real animal court case, let's take it back to 1457 France. Villagers in a town witnessed a sow and her six piglets attack and kill someone. Terrible story, sounds absolutely horrifying to have to witness. In this day and age, animal control would be called and all of those pigs would likely put down. But not in these times. When this happened, all the pigs were sent to court. Like real court. There was a judge, two prosecutors, eight witnesses, and a defense attorney for the accused animals. Witnesses provided testimony that proved that the sow had most definitely attacked the person and was definitely responsible for the crime. The piglets, however, well, for them, testimony was a bit murkier. There wasn't a witness who actually saw any of the piglets do any actual attacking. They just had blood on them, which isn't necessarily a sign of their guilt. It just means that they were there. This is why the court, while they did sentence the sow to death, the piglets were exonerated for their role in the crime. It's very strange and now would be a very expensive system, but in those times it really did work for them. Yeah, when it comes to marriage, it's always love versus politics. Medieval marriages tended to be negotiations, particularly around dowry, but it wasn't all about money. It was very important that a noble woman is a virgin at marriage purely out of pragmatic reasons. Marriage, after all, was an alliance union of two families that required healthy and admirable legitimate children to be truly locked in. It's for this reason as well as the violent men in society that the church laws stated that the degree of pressure to encourage a marriage could not sway a constant man or woman, aka no forced consent. What was forced however was up to debate, so don't be too proud of them for having that law in place. A woman was able to call off her marriage up until it occurred for this reason, as was a man. Should this occur, dowry was either returned in full or only partially as a fee for the failed union. 
Alongside this was the courtly love direction romance and marriage began to take in the middle mid ages during a Shakespearean and theatrical influence. Marriage started to become idealized. We'll circle back to how this affected people later, but lower classes consistently did marry for love since there is little to be gained materially from marrying for them. For most part there was no official ceremony that the social level marriage was more like hey we're married now and living together. By 1400 AD there were actually many laws decreeing marriages needed to start becoming a public affair and one may wonder how often people did marry in secret. Next up watch lords try to impress ladies with a lance measuring contest. As mentioned courtly love and chivalry are important facets of medieval society and culture and seeing as tournaments and displays of masculinity were centerpieces of this culture it's no surprise it made its way into courting. By 12th century England tournaments were in full swing usually consisting of jousting and melees a big organized throwdown between knights that were not expected to be dangerous but occasionally resulted in serious injury or death. These tournaments were respectable places to meet potential suitors and singles flocked to these spots to watch heroic knights joust and parade themselves around while noble maidens looked on adoringly. Some contemporary conservative commentators as well as the church however complained that the tournaments were places of frivolity, scandal and lust. Buzz kills. Don't worry if sword fighting isn't your to forte then poetry or songwriting were also popular ways to express your love to a lady. And remember when meeting a beloved dress to impress but not so much that you cause a scandal. Remember sumptuary laws exist it would be pretty embarrassing to be arrested and sentenced on your first date with someone. It was advised that medieval women getting ready for a date should wear their tallest steeple hat and their best dress and top it off with their finest linen wimple. This helped to elongate the neck. A long neck on a woman was considered beautiful. So was a bunch of other weird stuff that we'll get to in a second. Meanwhile men should always remember on a day to wear their best gown and hose which are pantyhose. But as said don't dress too posh. The sumptuary laws of medieval England such as the statue concerning diet and apparel of 1363 tried to ensure that citizens did not dress or consume above their social status. These rules included what kind of fur trims could be worn and by whom, colors, hats, patterns, shoes and all the whole shebang. Check out our video top 10 unusual medieval laws you never knew existed to learn more about sumptuary laws and laws of fashion. The rules of etiquette will most definitely help you avoid scandal when invited over to the family home of your potential lover and they were genuinely as follows. 1. Keep your hands clean. Don't stroke the dog or the cat. Be sure to wipe your fingers on the tablecloth instead of licking them. 2. Bones are not to be gnawed and don't pick your teeth with the sharp irons. 3. Don't eat with a fork. Forks were used to prepare food but most medieval Europeans thought forks were an odd thing to eat with. 4. Don't eat with a knife either. Many people carried the knives on them on their belt to carve up the food before eating but don't eat with it. 5. Ok. If it's a liquid use a spoon. People tended to eat with their hands for everything else. 6. Don't sit too close to the salt cellar. Salt was expensive and associated with prestige so it's a good dating tip at a big dinner to see who sat closest to the salt cellar. And 7. You can burp but look up at the ceiling as you do so and 8. Remember you must not urinate at the host's premises unless you're staying overnight and it's before bed. Obviously some of these things like wiping your hands on a tablecloth, eating without a knife or holding your pee until it's time to go are pretty unusual to us now. But back in the middle ages if you wanted that shorty and not to ruin your reputation well you're burping at the ceiling bro I hope she's worth it. Next up is how love makes you crazy. This is a fascinating wormhole to travel down and I learned from several journal articles that lovers in the middle ages had a real tendency to go mad. I mean we all know the examples. Elaine, the fair maid of Astrolot pining away. Romeo and Juliet taking their lives and the raving madness of Ophelia. But these are just dramatizations right? We tend to regard accounts of love madness in medieval literature as evidence that they overestimated the strength of erotic passion. In classical and early medieval periods sexual love was regarded as carnal appetite to be controlled. But with the rise of poetry sentiment and the theater came courtly love which was seen as a highly spiritual desire. The idea of courtly love had more to do with the concept of loving rather than pleasure. This idealized kind of love was based on a secret union where two lovers could only love from far away. These sorts of unattainable relationships were increasingly romanticized but in medieval society the notion that erotic love could drive people mad may not be so unrealistic. We understand now that mental illnesses are sometimes provoked by the stress between the individual and their social environment. Think of the pressure a woman had to marry. Her whole life is purely based on existing for marriage and childbirth. The headspace created would be incredibly vulnerable to valuing all self worth off of said marriage. If she had no suitors or faces rejection and begins to start aging out of normal marrying age these could be detrimental to her mind. Mental illness existed in the past. This level of self worth being carried by societal pressure that also 
also will punish a woman for her sexuality or existence of it should it be perceived as sinful or unwomanly is unbelievably stressful. So yeah, women primarily would literally be driven insane by marriage and their value being tied up in it. But it's okay to be crazy as long as you're hot. So let's follow these medieval beauty tips. These are actually documented tips I rounded up. So let's run through the list. First, pluck your eyebrows and move your hairline back. A high forehead was considered attractive. One hair removal recipe was a vinegar mixture with ant eggs and ivy. Yum. Second, cancel all your Mediterranean trips. You need to whiten your face. Paleness was considered beautiful and to achieve this some women would apply mixtures to their skin such as white lead powder mixed with sheep's fat. Weird. Third, while you're at it, hide those birthmarks and moles with homemade concealer. These blemishes were sometimes associated with witches in the middle ages. You may know this from our top 10 unspeakable things women went through in the dark ages video. One popular concoction was a face mask of bulls or hares blood. Fourth, brunette is boring. Go blonde with organic hair dye. Flaxen hair for women was considered the most beautiful. Women who were not blonde could try a hair dye made from stale sheep's urine and saffron. If word of mouth wasn't enough to get these beauty tips to you, rest assured. Daniel of Beckles wrote a popular 13th century etiquette book. Regarding appearance, he said a man's hair should be neatly styled with a beard that was neither long nor shaggy and nails should be attractive and teeth should be kept clean. How do you keep your teeth clean? One recipe for teeth cleaning in the middle ages was to mix sage leaves with salt, roll into balls, bake them into a powder and then rub them on the teeth. Sage advice indeed. And if you do not want to be a scandalous unmarried spinster, you better listen to it. And last but not least, don't forget to bring the hemlock. Whether you're two dirty knaves trying to get down lawlessly or a married couple who didn't want kids, hemlock was your best friend. So yes, while the medieval church made it clear that sex outside and for some clerics inside of marriage was sinful, the literary and documentary evidence suggests that these medieval Brits were still finding ways to be as randy as rabbits without an illegitimacy scandal. It was Hemlock, a recommendation made by 13th century author Peter of Spain in his book Treasure of the Poor. Peter wrote men should rub boiled paste of Hemlock on their boys before intercourse. Seeing as Hemlock is poisonous, this was ballsy. Obviously they were open to whatever suggestions they could get. When Persian physician Abba BMZ Razi works was translated, Europeans gobbled up his suggestions, which was applying cedar oil onto the nether regions before intercourse for a man or after for the woman. He also said that if the woman jumps backwards after intercourse, the uh, stuff will fall out. Seeing intercourse before marriage itself was illegal and knavery was perceived the way it was, I'm sure I don't need to explain the scandal in this one. Number 10, where's my mummy? Interior of a kitchen, oil on canvas, by Martin Drolling was painted in 1815 and depicts shades of browns, tans, beiges and golds that were remarkable of the era. Where did he get these colors some had wondered? Well good old Martin had a little help from the dead. Mummy Brown was appropriately named as it was made up of, you guessed it, ground up mummies. From the 16th to the 19th century many painters favored the pigment and it remained available well into the 20th century even as supplies dwindled. Egyptian mummies are rare nowadays not because a few survived thousands of years in their tombs but because few survived the aesthetic and cannibal demands of Europeans. Eating Egyptian mummies reached its peak in Europe by the 16th century. Mummies could be found on apothecary shelves, either in broken shards or ground into powder. So why did these nutcase Europeans believe that there was medicinal value in a mummy? Bitumen. Abundant in the Middle East where formed in geological basins of the remains of tiny plants and animals, it could be semi-liquid or semi-solid. It is viscous when heated and hardened when dried, making it useful for broken bones and rashes. Supposedly bitumen with wine cured chronic coughs and combined with vinegar, it'll dissolve clotted blood. Other uses included the treatment of cataracts, toothaches and skin disease. Because of the stickiness, it was called mum or mummia. You see where the mix up is coming in? So when the invasive colonial Europeans saw the black stuff coating these ancient remains for the first time, they assumed it to be that valuable bitumen or mummia they'd heard about. They were quick to start gobbling it down. The mummified remains of Egyptian pharaohs were sold as medicine in Germany well into the 20th century. And Speaking of the dead, how about using them for decor? Ballroom of bones is number nine. Not all bones are tasty enough to eat and sometimes you got more of them than you can handle. So that's where ossuaries come in. In older times when people perished often before 50, there was obviously a lot more human remains to be disposed of. But sometimes there's not more space. So as a space saving technique, the skeletal remains of buried
buried bodies would be dug up and moved into underground crypts called ossuaries. Many more remains could be stored that way, as bones didn't need the whole space that a body did, and could also be stacked, hung, or broken into position. The Brno ossuary in the Czech Republic is the second biggest in Europe, featuring chandeliers, artwork, words, crosses, really anything that can be made up of bones. These structures and pieces can be incredibly elaborate. Hall State Charnel House features hundreds of hand painted skulls, and the satellite church ossuary even features a large crown made up of human remains hanging over the pew where they preach from. If you're goth, you may want to consider that for a marriage location. Let's get hot with Greek fire in at number 8. Greek fire, arguably the Jesus of the flame world for its ability to walk on water, baffles historians and scientists alike to this day. Invented in the Byzantine Empire in the 7th century, this fire was used to defend their empire from invaders. Countless documentation verifies to us today that the stories of this fire was very real, but because its formula was a state secret, nobody's quite sure what it was used to create this liquid. The substance could be thrown in pots or shot from tubes. It apparently caught fire spontaneously and could not be extinguished with water. It could burn on top of it. It was heated and pressurized, then delivered via a tube called a siphon at the Grecian enemies. What's truly fascinating about Greek fire is that armies who captured the liquid concoction were unable to recreate it for themselves. They also failed to recreate the machine that it was delivered from. To this day, nobody knows exactly what the ingredients went into this mixture. Number 7. Groom of the Stool Ah, now this is a fancy sounding job title, Groom of the Stool. Got a bit of an air of quality to it. In truth, it actually was a bit of a respected lofty position. You had a very close hand to the royal throne. You had a very close hand to the throne. You had your hand pretty much behind the king's bottom at all times. The groom of the stool, to put it gently, was the royal wiper. You see, there's no one bigger or more important than the king, right? The king is like a god amongst common men, and no god should have to debase themselves to something as absolutely humiliating, as dehumanizing as using the bathroom by yourself. So that's where the groom of the stool triumphantly strides in, washcloth in hand. You were kept on retainer whenever the king felt nature's call. You were instructed to fetch the chair and take care of business. And the wipe? That's all you. That's all groom of the stool, baby. That's your moment to shine. And you know, a lot of grooms really got creative with this. They could show off their style, technique, wrist control. There's a lot of artistry to it that I think people realized. The groom of the king did more than just fetching and wiping too. As the man most connected with royal stool, the groom also shared the responsibility of monitoring what was going on down there for any changes in the king's health. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, but much heavier is the hand that wipes the bottom. Number 6, Cat Gut. Okay, in contrast to the last one that had a nice name, this one has a disgusting name, Cat Gut. Way back when in yesteryear, they didn't have the same tools available to us now when crafting musical instruments, so they had to get creative. If you wanted to hear something beautiful on violin, you couldn't just head on down to Long and McQuaid and pick up a pack of strings. You'd need a guy willing to get his hands wrist deep in some cat gut. Now, confusingly, no actual cats were involved, but plenty of sheep were. Violin strings were made of sheep's guts, and they would make the strings by twisting strands of sheep's intestines and innards together. Lovely. They'd have to be careful while butchering the animals to make sure they didn't accidentally harm any of the goods. This process would take hours out of time, from the butchering, the careful removal of the organs, and then they needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution to be clean since they were inside a sheep, and then stared at for a few hours to make sure nothing was going wrong, and then the drying process could begin. They say there is nothing more exciting than watching sheep guts dry. And then you can get your twist on, make them into violin. Absolutely disgusting, but when you hear the sweet strings of Ave Maria and you hear how finely tuned those sheep intestines are, you know it's all worth it. Number five, Sin Eater. This is one of the most metal job titles around. I'm pretty sure the Sin Eater was a boss in Elden Ring, wasn't he? He's in Caelid somewhere. This is definitely one of the more unholy jobs in this list. Not as disgusting as gut stringing or crap slinging, but pretty horrid in its own right. Sin Eaters ate sins, and the best way to eat a metaphorical concept of wrongdoing was to eat bread off the corpse of someone who died recently. The idea being that the sins of the man would be transferred onto the bread? I don't know. Anyway, they eat the sins and the deceased gets to go off to heaven without worrying about their history, could go on peacefully, and the sin eaters make some coin. They were willing to take a risk dooming their mortal soul for a bit of coin. Man's gotta eat. I wonder though, is it worth it? Like what if you eat too many sins and you don't have any room for dessert? Do sins have an added flavor? I imagine it's got like just a little kick, like a sriracha, like it's a little hot on your tongue. Number four, lime burner. Now a lime burner doesn't sound so bad at first. Lime mortar is a common building material, being traced back to the first century 
century, but it's not particularly easy to work with. Bear with me while I try to explain the technicals, I'm not as smart as a first century engineer, you see. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, taking the stone and cooking it in a kiln at around a cool 800 degrees. It's not too bad, right? Well that carbon monoxide has got to go somewhere, mostly in the air. All that carbon monoxide and dust chalk would just float around in the air where you'd be taking big heavy deep breaths in and I'm not sure how much you know about carbon monoxide but it's consistently the number one spot on Rolling Stones magazine list of top 100 substances to not breathe in. On top of this, did you know that superheated lime mortar is violently volatile against water? Meaning that if you were to sue, you know, sweat in a building that was 800 degrees at any given time, it would have disastrous consequences. Be careful. Number three, rat catcher. It doesn't sound fancy, but it's exactly what it says in the tin. You catch rats. You gotta wonder why you wouldn't just outsource this to the cat community. They're very good at this sort of thing. Rats, cute as I find them, at the time were filled to bursting with plague, disease, all kinds of grossness. Castle stock rooms were filled with grain, vegetables, and herbs, and if you're a rat, those are the things that make life worthwhile. Rats were a problem for nobility, but an even bigger issue for common folk and peasants, because if these little rats ate up what little grain you had, you would go destitute fast. But oh, come on, who can say no to their little posies and their little eyesies? I'm biased, I love rats. I would be a rat catcher if I could. Some rat catchers allegedly were reported to have raised their own supply of rats in order to squeak a few extra dollars out of the town. That's hilarious, by the way, love that scheme. Now traditionally, their methods would involve things like leaving out traps or poisoned herbs. That wasn't always enough though, so rat catchers would also invoke the old methods, namely, magic and try to entice rats away with spells. This often didn't work terribly well since rats are naturally resistant to magic, like everybody knows this. Number two, plague bearer. The plague ravaged London and Europe, leaving behind a wake of bodies and a stack of corpses as high as your medieval eyes could see. So somebody had to deal with all of that, right? A street sweeper of sorts was needed. You remember in Monty Python and the Holy Grail when Eric Idle is going around ringing his little bell, telling everyone to come bring out their dead? Hilarious, right? Well, it's partly based on reality because this is more or less what a plague bearer really was. The parish would hire out plague bearers who would then tour the streets of the village or town or whatever, wagon in hand, collecting the bodies of the ailing and dead to go dump in a mass graveyard shortly after. Tons of fun! They would spend their nights surrounded by dead bodies and their days in the church with the same dead bodies because according to the church's law, they were required to live there to prevent spreading what they were dealing with to anyone else. This might be history's first case of social distancing. And finally, at number one of the jobs you don't want is executioner. We've all heard of this one, and we're probably conjuring up a pretty vivid image of a burly shirtless monster in a black hood with a big ol' axe or something, wielded by someone who can't get enough of their day job and love their passion of separating necks from heads. In actuality, medieval people weren't that psychotic, and most executioners didn't join the practice out of a love of the game, but were usually coerced into it. Some were butchers who were called to the job, some were criminals who could do the job in exchange for a reduced sentence, but most commonly, it was a family business. If your dad was the town executioner, it was very likely you would be next in line to wear the hood. Now the downsides to this job seem immediately obvious, unless you're super into bloodshed and death, it's Probably not the cheeriest job, seems like the kind of thing you'd, you'd take home with you, you know? Kind of hard to lay loose and relax after that. But you know what's worse than the weight of taking another man's life? Social isolation. Executioners were not particularly well liked, looked down upon as outcasts, sometimes even forced to live outside of town. Ah, oh, well, you know what, executioner? It could be worse. You could be the groom of the stool, or you could be a nightman, so count your blessings. Starting us off is cutting edge courtship, quite literally in this case. It was traditional in some Nordic countries to have courtship customs involving knives and daggers. This is due to sacrificial nature in their original belief. The purpose of a dagger is prevalent for that after all, but it was also due to its functionality. In Finland, when a girl came of age, her father let it be known that she was available for marriage by providing her with an empty sheath. The girl would wear an empty sheath attached to her girdle, skirt, if a suitor liked the girl, he would put a pukoko knife 
in that sheath, which the girl would keep if she was interested in him. If she wasn't, she could just toss that anywhere. The knives were often custom, so a man would be able to woo a woman with unique details and imagery on a blade, but could also offer an heirloom or traded blade. Seeing as women of the Nordic region didn't shy away from handwork such as farming, jewelry making, clay working, etching, clothiers, and even some positions like smelting, a blade was a thoughtful and convenient gift that also said, I love you a whole dagger's worth. Something so romantic about giving someone a gift they could quite literally kill you with. In the meantime, while the scans are giving blades, the English are being taught the no-no days and the no-no ways. In layman's terms, they were being told how to have intercourse and when. That just doesn't make for a fun title. You may be familiar with these laws and regulations. They've come up in some of our other medieval and middle age videos. This was a time period where the church had a lot to say in state affairs. Not to say that it doesn't now, but they were able to make determinations such as intercourse schedules around the religion. Real laws were in place that people could not have sex on Sundays, Thursdays, or Fridays due to religious reasons. Whenever a holiday had a fasting period, such as Lent, abstinence was expected then as well. If anyone was to deviate from the set rules by having intercourse, they were committing a grave sin. These laws were written in penentials, which were books that indicated what was allowed under the church rules and what was not. Oral, backdoor, premarital, and self-inflicted intercourse were banned in these books. Now thankfully their wide range taboos included some good stigmas to have, such as interbreeding, so that minimized people keeping it in the family and messing up our future populations. But even with sexual laws, men could be knaves, which is just an old timely way of saying being a dog. Now I'm not saying ladies couldn't have itchy feet and dog their way around too, we do it now and we've been doing it then, but it was a lot worse for ladies to be caught back then. So the general consensus is that it was rare and when it did happen it was usually affairs outside of a marriage. In general, young medieval daters had to be cautious, while peasant marriages were a little more than saying we're married most of the time, reputation, especially for a lady, was huge as was virginal status. Men of higher status often sought out beautiful peasant girls for affairs. Sometimes they benefited the woman greatly and she'd become an heir to a status child, thus elevating her own. But for the most part, it was pure carnal enjoyment men were after in a time when women were told to do the opposite. And so it became a game of men trying to win a single woman into doing the act. She had everything on the line while he usually had nothing. Secret flings were frowned upon to say the least and were often seen as a sign of potential trouble, hence the English ballad that would warn of knaves preying on young fair maidens at country fairs. A young woman caught having affairs was a wild scandal that could even be punished for or put to death, so making the decision to bow to a lord's or even a common man's pressure could quite literally destroy a woman's whole life and being. Yet it's still a decision women made. Ah, hormones. Dance the day, night, and your life away with number 7 in the countdown. The Quebec incident is one of the first few recorded instances of dancing plagues. Later there are stories of unstoppable, sometimes fatal, dancing in the German town Effort in 1247. Shortly after, 200 people are said to have danced themselves all over a bridge of the Moselle River in Maastricht until it collapsed, drowning them all. The 1518 event was most thoroughly documented and probably the last of several such outbreaks in Europe, which took place largely between the 10th and the 16th centuries. A woman reportedly stepped into the street and began dancing, seemingly unable to stop, and she kept dancing until she collapsed from exhaustion. After resting, she resumed the compulsive frenzied activity. The more she continued, the more others were afflicted, and within a week 30 others mimicked her strange behavior. Alarmed city officials thought maybe more or better dancing was the solution, so they gathered up the real pros and some music and arranged dancing halls to help the afflicted boogie this out. Instead, the opposite happened, and now as many as 400 people were consumed by the dancing compulsion. A number of them died from their exertions. In early September, the mania began to abate, and that's the last we know of this phenomena. So what is this plague, and why were all these people dancing themselves to doom? Well, the explanation at the time was the usual stuff like demonic possession or your blood was too hot. Modern day, it's likely because of ergot poisoning from molding rye flour used to make their bread, as it's been known to cause hysteria and convulsions. To this day, hundreds of accounts of dancing plagues are found recorded in dark ages, but we have no explanation as to why. I don't see dead people, I see green people. The wolf hit alien children are number six in our countdown. Two English chroniclers reported a story from the 12th century that villagers of Woolpit discovered two children, a brother and sister, who had green skin and spoke an unknown language. The children were quickly taken to higher officials, Richard D. Colney's house, where he attempted to communicate and failed. The children also refused to eat for days on end until seeing green beans in the garden, which they ate straight out of the ground. They stayed with Richard long term as he converted them to a normal diet and they started to lose the green pigmentation. Obviously after time and growth these children learned English and when they were asked where they were from they told Richard, we are inhabitants of the land of St. Martin, who is regarded with peculiar
clear veneration in the country which gave us birth. They further explained that where they were from, everything was green, and they had been tending to their father's animals that they followed into a cave. Emerging out of it, they found themselves in Woolpit. The sun does not rise upon our countrymen. Our land is little cheered by its beams. We are contented with that twilight, which among you precedes the sunrise or follows the sunset. Moreover, a certain luminous country is seen not far distant from ours and divided by a very but considerable river. Shortly after this description of a non existent land, Richard took the children to be baptized in a local church. However, the boy died very shortly after from an unknown illness. The girl known as Agnes grew into adulthood and married. She remained private and spoke little to many. And so, the secret of their original homeland died with her. Children's Crusade is number five. Joining where the wild things are and labyrinth for most bratty and annoying kids is a boy in some stories named Stephen, who claimed to have been given a divine message from God to go forth and conquer the world. He was 12. Anyways, Stephen approached many royals looking for resources only to be turned away. He even asked for the support of King Philip of France who very rationally told the kid to go back home before bedtime. This was directly after the Holy Land Crusades, so it was mainly due to the fact that they believed he wanted to live out a hero legacy like his idols because he was 12. Like prepubescent boys, Stephen wasn't going to drop it when told no. He instead started preaching and recruited a band of faithful children to lead them into the Holy Land. One day, having found someone to supply his large gaggle of children, reportedly over a thousand, with a boat, Stephen loaded everyone up unarmed and unprepared and took to the seas. They were never seen again. It's believed Stephen's ship sank or the children were stolen by the ship crew and brought to Egypt for other unfortunate purposes. No matter what happened, the preachings of Stephen led to what's believed somewhat between a thousand and ten thousand children to their demise. Stephen is one of few documented children crusaders, none of which can technically even be labeled as a crusade because to fall under that title, a mission had to be delivered and blessed by a pope. No children's crusade was ever approved. Speaking of holy crusaders, the fate of the Templars is number four in our countdown. Founded in 1118 as a monstatic military, their duty was the protection of pilgrims as they traveled to the Holy Land following the Christian capture of Jerusalem during the First Crusade. The Knights of Templar quickly became one of the richest and most influential groups of the Middle and Dark Ages, erecting banks, castles, and churches, their wealth would be their downfall. A secret letter detailed black magic and scandalous sexual activities that was sent through France. The reality of this document was that it was made by King Philip of France, who notoriously stole and plundered from anyone he could. In response, more than 600 Templars are arrested, as well as hundreds of non-warriors who handled the day-to-day -day work such as banking, farming, and organizing. The men were charged with a wide array of offenses including heresy, devil worship, spitting on the cross, homosexuality, fraud, and financial corruption. The Templars, meanwhile, were kept in isolation and fed meager rations, all while facing brutal torture. Given the extreme conditions of medieval methods, it's not a surprise within weeks, hundreds of Templars just confessed to false charges. Their lands and money were confiscated and officially dispersed to another religious order, the Hospitallers, although greedy Philip did get his hands on some of the cash he coveted. Didn't know this guy was real, but the Pied Piper is number three. The proof is etched in the Hamlinia face itself, an inscribed plaque on the stone facade of the so-called Pied Piper's house dating to 1602 reads, AD 1284, on the 26th of June, the day of St. John and St. Paul, children Children born in Hamlin were led out of the town by a piper wearing multicolored clothes. After passing the Calverly near Copenburg, they disappeared forever. The tale, in fact, has survived a very long time. Originating as medieval folklore, it inspired the Grimm Brothers legend, The Children of Hamlin, and one of Robert Browning's best known poems, The Pied Piper of Hamlin. While there are some small differences in the stories, the basics remain the same. The piper was hired by the people of Hamlin to rid the town of rats. Trailing after their hypnotic notes, the rat catcher and his magical flute made them go to their demise. But when the town refused to pay the piper for his service, the savior came for Hamlin's children. Entranced by the notes of his magic flute, the boys and girls followed the piper out of town and simply vanished. So what happened to Hamlin's children? One theory is that the Pied Piper played the role of a so-called locator or recruiter. They were responsible for organizing migrations to the east and they were said to worn colorful garments and played an instrument to attract the attention of possible settlers. Popular opinion is, if this is the case, the children may have been taken to the Berlin area. As the family names common in Hamlin at the time, show up in surprising frequency in areas of Uckermark and Przenich near Berlin. An entry in Hamlin's town records dating 1384 laments that it's a hundred years since our children left. The stained glass window in town St. Nikolai Church, destroyed in the 17th century but described in earlier accounts, reportedly illustrated the figure of the Pied Piper leading ghostly white children away. And St. Anthony's fire number two in the countdown is not as cool as it may sound. When people of Paris were tormented with painful boil sore swelling and the sensation of fire in their skin, 
weekend, the only cure seemed to be a trip to St. Mary's Church in Paris. There, Duke Hugh the Great nourished the ill with his holy grain stores, said to help the ill recover. And they did. But as soon as they returned home, they had the plague again with terrible illness. The cause? St. Anthony's fire. The disease starts with faint burning in the skin. Soon red spots covered the infected person's body who felt like their limbs were on fire. Arms would swell and turn bright red, then terrible hallucinations would plague them, convincing them they were being assaulted by demons or dragged to hell. Finally, gangrene would set in and the victim's fingers and toes would drop off one by one. Once infected, few survived. So what caused this horrible disease and why did Holy Grain cure it? Well, if you've seen our video Top 10 Unusual Events from Medieval History, you may know about ergot poisoning. It's a fungus that grows on rye during cold and damp conditions. When the grain is ground up and then made into bread, people consume the fungus and poisoning ensures. So do cues stores of holy grain were better maintained because of his status and they weren't contaminated with ergot. When people ate his grains, their ergotism went away, but as soon as they returned home and they consumed their contaminated grains, they were poisoned again. Ergot would remain undiscovered still for years to come, and many forms of ergot poisoning would manifest in this time. Number one takes the video title seriously though, The Dark Age. It's said the ninth plague of Egypt was complete darkness that lasted for three days. Well, this may not be entirely wrong, with the exception of it actually being eight 18 months. In 536 AD, it said a huge portion of our world went under a dark mysterious fog that fell on Europe, the Middle East and parts of Asia. The fog blocked the sun during the day, causing temperatures to drop, crops to fail and people to die. As a result, countless documents were found in this country of mysterious darkness. However, they weren't taken seriously until the 1990s when researchers in Ireland noticed the rings on the inside of trees indicated some funny business around 536. Summers in Europe and Asia became 35 Fahrenheit to 37 Fahrenheit colder, China even reporting summer snow. They realized that the ancient witnesses were really actually onto something. They weren't being hysterical or imagining the end of the world. Now researchers also discovered what may be the main source of the darkness. A volcanic eruption in Iceland in early 536 helped spread ash across the northern hemisphere, creating a fog and altering the global climate patterns causing years of famine. With this realization, accounts of 536 become real horrifying real fast. I mean, put it in perspective. One day the world is plunged into darkness and then the sun just never rises again. In primitive times especially, this seemed to have a traumatic effect. We marvel to see no shadows at our, of our body at new, wrote Cassiodorus, a Roman politician. He also wrote that the sun had a bluish color and the moon had lost its luster and the seasons seemed to become jumbled together. Number 10, carrying a sword. Whenever we see medieval shows or hear stories or see art, everybody always has a sword at their side. I'll admit, on one hand, literally, it's pretty badass. Was this really that common though in the 12th century? Was everyone gifted a sword on their 16th birthday, like in Zelda Wind Waker? No, no, of course not. I mean, if you were traveling, sure, ideally you'd want a little dagger or a little something to help you out, but swords were a symbol of wealth and status. And the bigger and shinier the tune, the better, right? On average, these things would cost you seven months worth of wages. So you best start saving up and training. Yeah, you might want to train as well because these things were not light. No, not at all. Ideally, medieval swords would weigh three to four pounds. Doesn't sound like much at first, but I know after eight minutes, I would be switching arms real quick. It's like when you hold your hand up in class, you're like, oh God, what's going on here? Gotta do some push-ups. In our number nine spot today, we have the death cage. If you were to take a look at the punishments used in history, it quickly becomes clear that people of the past just really liked watching people die or have pain inflicted upon them. It's very strange. It's very dark, and it certainly is not for the faint of heart. The Death Cage is just one of the many horrifying punishments used during the Dark Ages. Essentially, this was just one method of execution that was extremely public, as they would strip the person down and lock them in an iron cage that was placed somewhere that everyone would be able to see. From here, the condemned person would be locked in there with no food or water, and everyone would just watch as they slowly died. Unbelievably messed up for a multitude of reasons, for sure. Sometimes, to make matters even worse, however, the condemned person would also be slathered in milk and honey so that they would also be attracting insects just to make the whole dying process even worse. It's all bad. I'm just thankful that those days are over. Number eight, the summer of 1348, AKA the Black Death. Now let's talk about this horrible event, shall we? If you thought summer 2020 sucked, well, 
buckle up, this one was pretty bad too. The bubonic plague traveled, the bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348 and the death toll here was absolutely devastating. Somewhere from one third to half of England's population gone, just like that and that's it. The plague hit hard and it hit fast. Now today we have variations of the virus, the one we shall not name, but back then the plague was a bacterium now known as Yersinia pestis. Now symptoms were quite jarring. You got lumps in the groin or your armpits, so that can't be comfortable. And next, the infected would notice black spots appearing all over their body. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not, without a fever, so you wouldn't see it coming, aside from the black spots and the things I just said. Now the drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth, workers were demanding higher wages, and farmers were demanding lower rents. The poor got expandable income, so it kinda, kinda helped, kinda didn't, I don't know, I don't know how to explain that. The black death spread more than a mile per day, and it's all thanks to traders and travelers. Yeah, humans can't stay still for a bit. We love traveling, even through the black death. Cause you know, why not, roads are empty. As long as there aren't any rats hiding on board, maybe you'll make it. Number seven. Leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches. Oh, so close. Number six, jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel, or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was was no funny business, that was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go, just show up and fart and be funny. How about this land? That's like a kingdom, you have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. It's crazy, you just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family, thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, I had good benefits. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom o the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps, thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history, maybe. We're almost there, you'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. 
If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of you know dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, Toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't have uh, any Toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know? Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show, getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow remover would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest, wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. This poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather, someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather, out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG. Historically, he would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher, actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. Number 10. Nightman. Oh, the name Nightman sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? If you're part of the Nightman, you might be a guild that washes over the dark, you know, protecting people like a superhero team, fighters of the day man, master of karate and all that. Well, if only life were that cool. No, you definitely would not want to be a Nightman. A Nightman was a very polite name for a job that boiled down to guy who cleaned human feces out of the cesspit. Yeah. You ever use a septic tank and thought, wow, this is prehistoric technology? Well, imagine a medieval precursor to a septic tank, if you will, 
and you've got yourself a cesspit. Easily one of the crappiest jobs in human history. Now the name makes it sound like you'd only be doing this for a few hours, right? Were it so easy, humble nightman? Nightmen would dig for weeks at a time gathering their goods, as they were usually paid by weight, not hours. Consider that, and then consider that any of the lovely amenities you and I have to avoid bacteria, masks, sanitizers, these guys had never even heard of and were shoveling stacks of crap by the literal ton with their hands and faces uncovered, huffing in unimaginable fumes. I imagine that's the kind of work that changes a man on the inside forever. Number 9. Fuller Perhaps one step down from the humble work of shoveling refuse all day like a nightman is the honest life of a fuller. You see, a fuller's job was to remove the oils from cloth woven from sheepskin and wool. Wool, naturally waterproof thanks to the oils on the sheep's skin, but the underside is very coarse and easily frayed and therefore needed to be dealt with before it can be made into things. Nowadays, we would just use an alkaline solution, call it a day. However, back then, chemistry sets weren't really like available, so you'd have to make do with what you had, right? And what better source of natural alkaline than in pee? Specifically old pee, nice and stale. We're looking for that burnt sienna orange. So the fuller takes the woven wool and cloth, soaks it in a nice giant tub full of old pee, and then stomps on it like you're crushing grapes for wine. Except it's not at all like you're crushing grapes for wine because you're stomping on wool full of old pee. It was fairly common as well for fullers to, uh, to source their own alkaline solution, for lack of a better word. There was no royal distributor of old pee, you couldn't stroll up to the pee man, so they'd have to scrounge and collect it themselves, and if that meant heading to public toilets and private homes, knocking on the front door with their hands held open for a big handout, you know, every drop counts. I can't believe I'm getting paid to say this. Number 8. A whipping boy. Have you ever heard the expression whipping boy? To be someone's whipping boy? I know I've certainly heard it a lot, but the history of it is actually pretty fascinating. It was a real position. And basically your whole job as whipping boy was to take the licks for a misbehaving royal. When you have an up and coming noble figure, a prince, a duke, this sort of thing, when they're being taught by their tutors it would be an unimaginable offense to strike the royal for misbehaving, as their status was leagues above of the tutors. But you can't have someone misbehaving without any retribution at all, right? A little negative motivation to push you to work harder and learn harder. That is where a whipping boy comes in. The whipping boy, sometimes a friend of the prince being taught, would be struck in front of the prince in order to motivate him to not commit the same transgressions. It seems a bit like a bit of a flawed system because from what I know of medieval European history, it's that kings and princes were rarely remembered for their generosity and compassion for their employees. Now bizarrely, whipping boy was actually seen as a fairly desirable position since it meant you had like an in with the king. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure many young princes saw the guy who was being beaten over the head with a broom and thought this man is my equal and my confidant and a trusted ally. Number Seven, inns and taverns. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the difference. Yes, there's drinking in both, and yes, both of them don't smell so great. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably, whereas a tavern, not so much housing. More rough housing, if anything, if you catch my drift. Say you're passing by one of these taverns, right, Saturday night, you feel like grabbing some questionable ale from some questionable establishment, well, you better come prepared. In the Middle Ages, you had to bring your own fork everywhere you went. Just a single, just one fork on your side, on your person, that's so gross. We didn't have a guy sitting in booth 11 doing roll ups all night looking at you just wishing that he didn't work there, right? This was the middle ages, you didn't have a fork, no one had forks. If you had a fork you were lucky, right? You were the rich kid on the block with an in-ground pool, that was you if you had a fork. Steak knives also were only reserved for carvers, so until the 17th century you were just poking around your meal until you had a bite sized amount and then you will choke on it because it's all horrible. It's all chewy and horrible. In our number six spot today we have the filth. If you lived in a city during this time in history, it would have been an absolutely filthy place to be. I mean, human and rats lived in harmony. Not harmony, re the plague. But things were so dirty, rats were everywhere. Want to go swimming in the nice stream nearby? Huh, well good luck, because not only is that body of water used for dumping sewage, but it's also for the village's water supply to both drink and bathe in. Disease was plentiful, obviously, and it spread exceptionally quickly. Spreading disease was even easier considering how all of the homes were packed full of people and no one really knew anything about hygiene and the benefits yet. 
health and otherwise. If you were to go out in the evening, especially at past curfew, it was also an insanely huge risk. Going out ran you the risk of getting killed or robbed with no police on the streets to help protect you at all. While city living provided a bit of safety in numbers situation compared to the countryside and also provided more opportunities to make money, it was still quite a risky place to live during the dark ages. Number five, teeth worms. Awesome, you have any cavities? Now you're gonna be looking this whole video. Dentists weren't common back in the dark ages, but they did have a barber. So I guess we're good for a few hundred years. This guy did it all. Cavities, toothaches, teeth worms, gross, you name it, he'll pull it out violently. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, your classic three-in-one appointment right there, really all in 10 minutes or less. Instead of brushing with tooth tunes, back then you would rub your teeth and gums with a rough linen. Yeah, just grab an old shirt, it's an old dirty shirt we're gonna brush up for school. Like you're playing a harmonica, only dirty shirt. A few recipes have been discovered since for pastes and powders to freshen their breath back then, you know. Otherwise, you were pretty screwed, you had nothing. We went from powdered charcoal to charcoal toothpaste all over again. What a weird loop we did. Mouthwashes were also made from herbs and spices steeped in wine or vinegar, so fresh breath guaranteed, no doubt about it. In our number four spot today, we have the stripes ban. We've all met someone before who seems to be concerned with what other people are wearing, and we jokingly refer to them as the fashion police. But back in the dark ages, you might come across some very real fashion police who are actually interested in fining you, should your finest tunic not be of the local dress code. Sometimes it wasn't even just a fine. Some serious fashion faux pas could lead to your imprisonment or even your death. Stripes were definitely a main culprit in these times, as striped clothing was seen as a garment of the devil. I'm not even exaggerating either. In the year 1310 in a French town, there was a local cobbler who was put to death because he had been caught in striped clothes. Yeah, we thought the tabloids were harsh, and I mean, they are, but the medieval fashion police were unforgiving. Not only were members of clergy not exempt from this rule, but neither were animals. Yeah, calling all zebras. Good luck out there, man. This is why zebras were called beasts of the devil. And yes, this is even though the people of Europe hadn't even seen them just heard tales of their striped nature. Number three, no rules football. In honor of the World Cup coming to a close, we have to take a look at football back in the late 12th century. Yeah, what did that look like? Or feel like, rather? Instead of corner kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve the ball from the opposing team. Yeah, anything. Left hooks, some kicks, some jabs, throwing rocks, anything, you name it, it was violent. No diving in these games, I'll tell you that for free, you didn't have to. There was also no time limit, <clears throat> there was also no limit to how many players could be involved. So, choose your team wisely, pick the biggest guy, pretty much. It's town versus town a lot of the time, there's a lot of emotions out there settled on the field. And in the middle of it somewhere, there would be a soccer ball rolling around. I would call this a sport. Now finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. And yeah, more than fair. All his civilians and citizens are dying. He's like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not wise. I don't know. In our number two spot today, we have fast medieval marriage. There are so many messed up medieval marriage practices. We could do an entire video on just that. And in fact, we have. Go check those out. But while you're here, let's talk just a bit about them. Marriage in the medieval times was quick and easy, but also difficult to prove. If you and your loved one wanted to get married, all you really needed to do was say, we're married, and then boom, it's done. Of course, this led to a whole pile of those spur of the moment type marriages, especially considering how sex before marriage was widely condemned in these times. You know, people are like, eh, it. We're married now, let's do it. Well, I'm pretty sure many people who were divorced would have preferred if their marriages were this easy. This led to people, of course, taking advantage of this difficult to prove thing. Most especially women would often fall victim to a man who might want to take you as his wife for the night. But then the following day, after getting what he wants, he denied ever agreeing to the union of the two. If you're catching my drift. This is why many women tried to get at least one witness to union, just in case. And finally, number one. Pointed shoes. 
This one's so fun. Whenever I see anything that's related to the medieval times, I always admire the attire, right? Especially the shoes. I hate buying shoes today so much. Now they're so specific. You got walking, running, trail shoes. They're always so expensive. Nobody does it like the medieval times anymore. Specifically, Krakows. Krakows were awesome. They were the style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century Europe that looked really ridiculous. They had the long, huge long nose that went up really high. They're so silly looking, maybe that's why I love them. These long toed shoes first appeared in the 12th century, but the Krakow, the thing is, these things were twice as long as your foot, and that was considered fancy back then. These meant business, so you better watch those ankles, Beth, all right? We're going into some meetings fast. They were named after the city that they were made in. Krakows were worn by everybody at one point, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the more valuable you were. There we go. So it turned into a joke eventually, right? These things got way too long and it looked ridiculous. You ever walk around in flippers beside the pool where you do that big silly walk? That's the walk that everybody was doing in town, right? It was out of hand. They would be stuffed with horse hair or moss. Yeah, which is just as comfortable as Dr. Scholl's. Imagine stepping around in moss all day. Yuck. Also, sometimes a string would be needed to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee just to keep these damn things afloat. So everybody at one point in time, in the medieval times, looked like a Muppet tied to strings. How amazing is that? Do you own any Krakows? If so, how do we get our hands on a pair? I'm a size 11 and a half Krakow. Let's make it happen. Maybe if we all pitch in as a community. I don't know, we can all be wearing Krakows tomorrow. Starting our list off at number 10, don't steal crops. In medieval times, stealing crops was considered a very serious crime. As funny as it may seem in your head. See a guy grab a vegetable and run away. Crops were a vital source of food and income for farmers and communities. There's no Uber Eats back then, all right? Somebody steals your tomatoes, you're fucked. In some cases, the punishment might be a fine or restitution paid for the victim, while in more serious cases, the thief might be subjected to public humiliation or physical punishment, such as whipping or branding. Yeah, branding somebody publicly, all because you ate the wrong apple off the wrong tree. Repeat offenders might, of course, face more severe punishments because something's afoot here, okay? We're not buying your story this time. Such as imprisonment or banishment from the community. Yeah, banishment. Just get out of here. Next village. See ya. Overall, stealing crops was not taken lightly in medieval society at all, and it could result in significant consequences for the offender. Branded, getting branded because he stole a crop. That's embarrassing almost. Number nine, don't steal at all. Yeah, let's rewind the clocks back a bit more. Don't take anything ever. How's that sound? Sweden's Bjarki laws were a set of Viking era laws that governed maritime trade and piracy. Now, they were enacted in 832 AD, pretty old school, and they included punishments for various crimes, including theft and piracy. The punishment for stealing in a Viking society, it of course varied depending on the severity of the crime, the value of the stolen goods, and or the social status of the offender. But for minor thefts, the offender might be required to pay restitution or make amends to the victim. This could involve returning the stolen goods, paying a fine to them directly, or performing a service for them, you're basically a slave for them. For more serious offenses, such as repeated thefts or stealing from a chieftain, a chieftain, the punishment might be more harsh. And this is where we get into the nitty gritty of our list. Here, the offender might be stripped of their social status, exiled from the community, or even, yeah, killed, the worst of the worst. Now, in some cases, the punishment for stealing could also involve public shaming. That in the Viking era, I didn't want to know what that would look like. The offender might be paraded through the community or subjected to other forms of humiliation. Yeah, we'll get to the lung stuff a little bit later on. Slowly but surely, we'll get there. You have to start at theft and then work our way to the lunging and the horrible knee-breaking stuff. Number eight, arson. Capital punishment was a common punishment for arson in the medieval age. Sounds a bit harsh, but hear me out. Last time I was on this channel, I was talking about the Great Fire of 1666. It took 15 lives, but ultimately this fire, it forced officials to rebuild a great part of the city, restructured everything. This changed history. Fire in medieval towns equals trouble. It's gonna spread quite fast. A lot of wood, a lot of woody stuff. So if you were found guilty for arson, well, buddy, you're screwed. Arson, the deliberate setting of fire to property, it was considered a serious crime and was often punished severely in order to deter others from committing similar crimes, right? In some cases, arsonists were killed by hanging or they were burned themselves at the stake. Yeah, burning at the stake was a particularly gruesome form of capital punishment in which the accused was tied to a post or a stake and then they were set on fire. Again, this is all a public affair. People came out to watch this, horrible. 
Horrible. Hide your, hide your eyes. We're not gonna watch this one. In our number seven spot today, we have the meowing nuns. Mass hysteria wasn't necessarily uncommon in the Dark Ages. There are a few instances we could discuss, but for today, I want to talk about one of my favorites. In the book, The Epidemics of the Middle Ages, which was written by J.F. Hecker in 1844, there was the description of a very strange case of mass hysteria that broke out among nuns in a French convent in the Middle Ages. Basically, one day a nun in this French convent started to meow like a cat. I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how this started, all I know is that it happened. And you know what else happened? Other nuns in the convent began to also meow like cats. Eventually it became such a thing that all of the nuns in the convent would meow together for a certain period of time. And of course, everyone surrounding this area was like, what in the absolute heck is going on right now? This is actually a huge problem because in these times, cats were hated. People associated cats with the devil and with disease, so a bunch of meowing nuns was like the equivalent of doomsday. Apparently, the way that this stopped was that the police came and threatened to whip the nuns if the meowing didn't stop, which is definitely one of the weirdest things I've ever said. Number six, peddlers. Ah yes, that medieval businessman just wandering along in the pine forest in hopes of not getting robbed, a classic image from medieval times. The Dark Ages were a dangerous game, right? So one could only imagine how hard it must have been for a merchant who travels the countryside for a living to sell goods. In Breath of the Wild, you're like, oh, thank God, there's that one guy with all the goods that I need. How convenient is this? Awesome. That's not in real life. In the Middle Ages, traveling village to village wasn't an easy task. You couldn't order an Uber and then voila, and unless you were a knight, you probably didn't have a noble steed to take you there. But even so, an outsider showing up to your village to sell goods from a distant land, I don't know, sounds a little sus if you ask me personally. Peddlers were more often than not welcomed with suspicion by locals. Most of the time, peddlers were just accused of being criminals. Even if they weren't, guy shows up, he's like, hey, wanna buy some watches? They're like, you're a robber, you're going away. In our number five spot today, we have donations. In the dark ages, it wouldn't necessarily be strange to either donate or sell your own urine. Yeah, the market was hot for urine because they used it a bunch during this time in history. Medieval chamber pots would collect all of the stuff from an entire household or public space wherever they were placed. And oftentimes they could later be sold at the local tanner or fuller in town. I mean, talk about an easy way to make some money, but how horrible. The reason this product was so popular is because it was used in a variety of ways. It could be used to clean clothing, to help with the dyeing process, to tan leather hides, and like I spoke about in a recent video, be used to help in the cotton making process in order to make the material soft and not frayed. While the practical uses make the wholesale process a little less peculiar, it honestly still would just be weird to have to sell your own pee or your neighbor's pee. Number four. Color coordinated. I get it, on Wednesdays we wear pink, it's nice to add a little color into your schedule at work in the office. It's fun, sure, have at it. In medieval times, they were serious about their looks and colors. There was no fun around back then. Having rules about what colors and what type of clothing and hats you could wear, you named it. It was all based on your occupation or social level. Some colors were banned for certain professions. Imagine that. For example, imagine if you were a night worker, right? If I can say that, a woman lady of the night. You weren't allowed to wear certain styles or colors. Colors. That's hilarious. Hey, welcome to Ontario. We don't wear jeans here. Got it? All right, now get in. 15th century English law banned knights or anybody below knights from wearing velvet, which is so random to me and so funny looking back now. Imagine that. And you may know this one, but purple was a fancy color back then. Purple has been associated with royalty even since the ancient world. Natural purple dye was rare, and medieval Europeans believed that mixing dyes was unnatural and diabolic. It was a no-no. So they were missing out on purple for quite a while because they didn't want to you know, mixed goods, if I can say that. In our number three spot today, we have divorce by combat. If you talk to most people who are divorced nowadays, they'll tell you about how awful the divorce proceedings can be. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and sometimes things get pretty heated. While these harrowing tales are definitely less than delightful, things could definitely be worse. And by worse, I mean you could be getting a divorce in the dark ages, by way of combat. The first documented instance of this was created by Hans Talhofer in a 1467 
manuscript. He wrote, quote, As per the instructions, the husband was put up to his waist in a three foot wide hole dug in the ground with one hand tied behind his back. The woman was to be armed with three rocks, each weighing between one and five pounds, and each one wrapped in cloth. Basically, the man couldn't leave the hole, but the woman could run around the edge of the pit. He continued on, quote, If the man touched the edge of the pit with either his hand or arm, he had to surrender one of his clubs to the judges. If the woman hit him with a rock while he was doing so, she forfeited one of her stones. While this sounds like an insane process, it really was true and continued on before growing rare in the early 13th century. Not only has the discovery of this historical practice shed light on something we previously did not know, but it also gives us a glimpse into the gender dynamics of the time period. We're not entirely sure how this sort of divorce ended, but many speculate that this basically continued on until one of them died or one of them surrendered. Number two, bucket family style. For my last one today, we're getting real cozy. Real cozy. Remember in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when all his grandparents have to share that one rickety old bed? Well, that's what everybody at home looked like in the dark ages. Imagine being in the middle. I'm already anxious thinking about it. Just stuck. I mean, think about it though. Back then, space was so limited. Warmth is also a plus in those winter nights. And beds, they were massive. They were made of straw and wood. It was a whole thing. It was a whole situation. It's not like you could fit more than one of these in your home. No way, Jose. Even in the royal household, this was a common theme. King Richard I of England and King Philip II of France both had to sleep in the same bed as an act of diplomacy. Again, I would be so anxious and awkward there. I'd be like, oh, excuse me, Mr. King guy. You're snoring too loud. In our number one spot today, we have affairs of the court. If you know anything about marriage in the Dark Ages, you know that love was often not a part of it. To sort of piggyback off my last point, if you were in a loveless marriage like most everyone else was in the time, but didn't want to go through the process of beating your spouse to a pulp or any of the other divorce methods at the time, you could instead turn to courtly love. This wasn't for the common household and instead was for members of the court, but it allowed the lords and ladies of the time to experience love and courtship despite what their marital status might be. Yeah. It was a place for married people to go and hook up. Well, not entirely. I mean, there of course were roles in place and society was very pious, so people weren't exactly hooking up. But it was a huge hit. People danced, they giggled, they flirted, and sometimes people could even be caught holding hands. One of the rules of courtly love just stated, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. Deal for number 10. I mean, if we're gonna defend Pedro the Cruel, he was obliged to defend his throne against his father's uh, 10 illegitimate sons. On the other hand, they wouldn't have had so much more support from the people than the king himself if Pedro hadn't outraged his people with arbitrary killings, drama, and rules, as well as the pretty cheap treatment of his wife Blanche, the sister of the king of France. His father, Alfonso, had ditched his wife, Pedro's mom, Maria of Portugal, for his mistress once Maria had produced their son. Exiled away from court, Pedro grew up listening to his mother's hatred for his father, yet when he took the throne, he did an almost exact rinse and repeat. Pedro publicly married Mary's Blanche, despite already having secretly wed one of his mistresses, and he abandoned and imprisoned her very shortly after. Basically, if someone looked sideways at him, Pedro had them killed. He inaugurated his reign in 1350 by killing supporters of his half-brothers, and also had his father's mistress killed for his mother. He was said to have killed a man for looking at him wrong way, and burned a woman alive for rejecting his advances. Pedro's new son-in-law, Edward the Black, got blessed with a large gem that he had obtained by robbing and killing a guest in his own house. He also put a hit out on Blanche in the end, and she died via crossbow to the eye. And of course, needless to say, Pedro killed as many of his own half-brothers as he could get his hands on, primarily through various forms of deceit. On to number 9, which is Charles of Navarre, who can also be called the Double Crosser's Double Crosser. See, Charles came from a branch of French royalty that had renounced its claim to the throne, but clearly Charles did not share that sentiment. He is crowned in 1349 and was driven by revenge and a disproportionate sense of of entitlement, quickly earning himself the nickname Charles the Bad as he attempted to expend Navarre's territory into France and Spain via schemes, plot, and deception. Ultimately, he failed and ended up marginalized and alone. In the words of historian Barbara Touchman, Charles was volatile, intelligent, charming, violent, cunning as a fox, ambitious as Lucifer, and more truly than Byron, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. His only constancy was hate. One of Charles's first targets was King Jean II's favorite minister, whom he had killed 
killed by thugs. Over the next three decades of the Hundred Year War, as France contested with England for control over territory on the continent, Charles changed sides so quickly and so often that it made everyone's head spin, and making contradictory deals with each side of a conflict at the same time. He attempted one coup and twice tried to poison the king in like a real life Game of Thrones fashion. And trust me, there's a lot of old nobility stories like this one, so if you're interested in hearing more of them, I recommend you take a moment to subscribe to The Hive. Edward III is on our countdown at number 8, and he pulled a total King David. He sent his homie Earls of Salisbury to go fight wars in foreign countries so he could go try to bang the Earl's wife on the sly. However, the Countess refused the King's slick idea, but Edward didn't accept that answer and returned after dark. He tells the valets to quote, nothing must interfere with what he was going to do on pain of death. Contemporary accounts from the time, of which there are five parts, detail how the Countess was left in an absolutely horrific state. And by the time her husband returns, she's fallen into a deep depression and admits to her husband what has happened. The Earl goes into a blind rage, understandably, and goes straight to Edward, who was holding court at the time. In front of dozens of witnesses, the Earl confronts his once friend saying, you have villainously dishonored me and thrown me in the dung, and continues to tell Edward that his actions were so disgusting and inhuman that he could no longer live in the same country with the monstrous king and then just left England forever. As for the Countess Alice, all we know of her her fate is that the Earl made sure she had an independent income and was returned to her family's care before he left. At number 7, Feast of Fools. One of the more lively aspects of the Dark Ages was the many festivals and holidays that were celebrated. Though most of the population worked grueling hours for days on end, they often got breaks to hold celebrations. Most holidays and celebrations that were held were religious, but others were just silly and were designed for people to have fun, like the Feast of Fools for example. The Feast of Fools was held in early January and was inspired by the pagan festival of Saturnalia. This was a pretty interesting festival because it involved swapping the highest respected officials with serving maids and they became masters and were crowned kings of misrule. This festival first started as something confined to the church, but soon it became a bigger affair with parades, comic performances, music, costumes, and even drag. These people really liked their festivals. Another pretty weird festival that they held was the Festival of the Ass, where a young girl carrying a child would ride on the back of a donkey into a church and during the service, instead of saying amen, they would say hee haw like a donkey. I know, bizarre, right? At number 6, Soccer. These days, people regard soccer or football as a modern European sport, and though it is popular in these modern times, it turns out that the sport has been around a lot longer than you might think. Soccer was first played back in the Dark Ages, however it is very different from the soccer that we know today. Back then the sport didn't even really have a name and there were no rules either. The only thing that people followed when playing the game was the objective of winning. Back then you were allowed to win by any means necessary besides deliberately offing people of course. Back then soccer became known as a pretty brutal sport. It was violent, chaotic, bloody and sometimes even deadly. It involved an infinite amount of players so it was really a free for all on the playing field. The sport was so intense that in 1314 King and Edward II banned the game decreeing quote, on pain of imprisonment such games to be used in the cities in future. End quote. Glad things have changed since then because FIFA would be really intense if it hadn't. At number 5, weddings. Marriage and weddings back in the dark ages were very different than they are today. Back then because the average life expectancy was so low, people started getting married and having kids very young. Usually girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, around the age of 12, and these marriages were not for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or for alliances. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriages just weren't as big of a deal back then as they are today, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies were held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this it made it really hard to know who was really married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. To make things even weirder, the consummation of marriage was also pretty odd because it wasn't a private affair. The act of bedding wasn't seen as an intimate moment between the couple, but rather an investment in the union, so it was observed by witnesses. I am certainly glad things have changed. At number 4, Jesters. 
You would think that being a court jester in the Dark Ages would have been a pretty bleak job, but you would actually be wrong. I mean, yeah, they looked funny with their outfits and hats modeled after the ears of a donkey, but jesters actually held a lot of power in court, making their job a pretty good one compared to other common folk. The court jester's job was to make people laugh by doing tricks, stunts, and telling jokes. Sometimes the jester would poke fun at the king or lord that they served, or would make comments about a kingdom's politics. And for a lot of people, saying these types of things would give them a one-way ticket to the gallows, but not the jester. Because of their profession, by royal decree, anything that they said was taken as a jest or a joke, so no one could get mad or offended at what the jester said or comments on. Basically, the jester was the one person in the court who was immune from medieval cancel culture. They could offend anyone they wanted to, and no one could stop them. At number three, unicorns and Jesus. The thing about the Dark Ages is that it was full of superstition and mythology. Within this period of time, there was a lot of confusion when it came to religion as paganism and the rise of Christianity were both hot topics. Many times, superstitions and mythology from paganism made its way into the religious beliefs of Christians and things were known to get a little weird. Take for example the unicorn and how it was incorporated into the Christian beliefs of the Dark Ages. It is believed that a mistranslation of what is thought to have been an ox is what brought unicorns Unicorns into Christianity. Because of this mistranslation, the Bible likened Jesus to a unicorn. Since it was in religious texts, people in the Dark Ages sort of just ran with it, and so they started incorporating the unicorn into many religious artworks. To further this whole unicorn thing, they made up a superstition that only innocent maidens were allowed to touch unicorns, and they even used the unicorn to come up with a rather uncomfortable allegory of Christ entering Mary's womb. This unicorn thing was also fueled by the Vikings at one point, as during the medieval age, Vikings were known to con people into buying narwhal tusks marketed as real unicorn horns. At number two, divorce by combat. Back in the Dark Ages, if you wanted a divorce, you had to be willing to fight for it. Literally. In medieval Germany, couples would take to the ring to settle their disputes, and it was quite the showdown. Trial by combat was the common way of settling arguments back then, but when a husband and wife were fighting, things were a little more interesting than just having an all out brawl. During these divorce by combat proceedings, the husband had to stand in a hole with his hands behind his back, while the wife ran around in a circle with a bag full of rocks. I don't really see how this settled anything, but who am I to question the methods of the Dark Ages? And finally, at number one, Animal Court. I think that one of the weirdest things about life in the Middle Ages was their legal cases. As I just told you, their divorce proceedings were literally a trial by combat. They also found bizarre ways of trying someone if they were accused of witchcraft as well, and that was pretty dark, but the strangest court battles involved animals. Yes, animals were sometimes put on trial back in the Dark Ages. All animals from livestock to pets and even insects were not safe from the law and they would be put on trial if they were suspected of breaking the law. According to records from the Dark Ages, at least 85 animals were put on trial for a number of reasons. Pigs were the ones who were put on trial most often for chewing off people's body parts and even eating children. In 1474, a rooster was put on trial and found guilty of the unnatural crime of laying an egg, and even unwanted rats were put on trial and received strongly worded letters demanding that they leave the premises. The most bizarre case though involved a donkey who went through a legal trial and actually won. This donkey became the victim of unwanted advances, but was deemed innocent because someone declared her to be quote, virtuous and well-behaved animal, end quote. These people had way too much time on their hands. Before I wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me what you thought the most bizarre Dark Age tradition was from this list. There's lots to choose from, so let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. 
Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chain mail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages. Pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A Lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, uh, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them? What do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around. So now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights and you know the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like what a joke, I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, House of Alloy. The House of Alloy faced internal conflicts, external threats, and controversies that shaped the political landscape of the medieval and early modern France. These challenges contributed to the broader historical developments and transitions in European history during this period. The Hundred Year War, a conflict between England and France, began during the reign of Philip VI of Alloy. The war had a significant political, economic, and social consequences for both countries. Battles, again, such as the Agnicourt of 1415 and the Joan of Arc's involvement, further fueled the controversies during this period. The Treaty of of Troyes was a controversial agreement that recognized Henry V of England as the heir to the French throne and it disinherited the Dauphin of Charles. The Valois dynasty had complex relationships while other European powers, including the Burgundian Dukes and the Habsburgs, marriage alliances and conflict with these houses influenced the courses of European politics and sometimes resulted into controversial outcomes. Number six, the Carolingians. The controversial and challenges faced by the Carolingians dynasty reflect in the complex political, social, and economic dynasties of their time. The eventual fragmentation and decline of the Carolingian Empire paved the way for the rise of new political entities, restructuration of medieval Europe. After the death of Louis the Pious, the empire faced internal strife over succession. The Treaty of Verdun in 843 divided the empire into three parts. Among Louis' three grandsons, marking the beginning of the separate kingdoms of West Francia, East Francia, and Middle Francia. This division contributed to the fragmentation of the Carolingian realm, and the Carolingian Empire faced repeated Viking raids and invasions during the 9th century. These raids led to widespread devastation, economic disruption, and challenges to the Carolingian authority. The inability to effectively repel Viking incursions raised questions about the empire's ability to provide security, and the internal struggles, the power struggles, conflict among the rulers and their noble supporters were reoccurring issues among the time. Civil wars such as rebellions against Charles the Bald, great name, in West Francia and Louis the German in East Francia and high highlighted the instability within the empire. Number five, House of Lusignan. The House of Lusignan, the medieval French noble family, which again, my bad if I can't say their name, I mean, I think they're still around, became particularly notable for its involvement in various European regions, including Cyprus and the Kingdom of Jerusalem during the Crusades. 
decades. Guy of Lusignan, a member of the Lusignan family, became the king of Cyprus after the conquest of the island by Richard of the Lionheart during the Third Crusade. This event marked the beginning of the Lusignan dynasty rule in Cyprus. However, the circumstances of Guy's rule was very controversial as he faced opposition from local nobles and factions. The Lusignanans were also involved in the Kingdom of Jerusalem during the Crusades. The loss of Jerusalem in Saladin in 1187 was a significant blow and the subsequent attempts to regain control faced challenges. The fall of Acre in 1291 marked the end of the Crusaders' presence in the Holy Land. James II of Cyprus faced controversies during his reign, marked by conflicts by the Venetians and internal oppositions, and his rule was characterized by the political intrigue and financial difficulties, and he eventually abdicated in favor of his daughter, Charlotte. The Lusignanans were initially a prominent noble family in France before branching out to other regions, and their involvement in various political and military activities in France added to the family's overall historical significance. Number 4. The House of Lancaster and York as mentioned in number 5 was initially a prominent noble family in France before branching out to other regions, their involvement in various political and military activities in France added in the family's overall historical significance. As we know from number 8, one of the most enduring controversies of the War of the Roses is the fate of the young princes in the tower, Edward V and his brother Richard, who disappeared while under the guardianship of their uncle, Richard III. The mystery surrounding their disappearance had led to various theories including possibilities of their death, and the execution of Richard, Duke of York, the father of Edward IV and Richard III, was a pivotal event that intensified hostilities between the houses. It set the stage for further conflicts and fueled the desire for vengeance. The Battle of Tow Town was one of the largest, bloodiest battles of the War of Roses. The Yorkist victory of Tow Town secured the throne for Edward IV, but was resulted in significant of casualties that further enmity between the houses. The War of Roses left a lasting impact on the English history, shaping the course of the monarch and influencing the subsequent events. Number 3. The House of Draculesti Vlad the Impaler belonged to the House of Draculesti, a noble family with the ties of the Order of the Dragon, a chivalric order. The name of Draculesti is often associated with the Romanian word Dracul, meaning devil or dragon. The association of the dragon is sometimes linked to the title Dracula, famously associated with the vampires in later folklore. Vlad's father, Vlad II, was the member of an order of the dragon. However, the circumstances surrounding his reign and relationship with other nobles, including political allegiance and conflicts, have been subject of historical debate. Vlad and his younger brother, Radul, was held captive by the Ottoman Empire as a form of assurance for their father's loyalty. Vlad's imprisonment and the events that led to his release are not entirely clear and there are different accounts of the conditions of his captivity and return to Wallachia. One of the most controversial and notorious events associated with Vlad the Impaler is the night, of, is the night attack of the Trevogati in 1462. After reclaiming the throne, Vlad launched a brutal campaign against the Ottomans and his political rivals. Thousands were reportedly impaled on long sharp stakes earning him the epithet the Impaler. The controversial aspect of Vlad's rule has contributed his lasting legacy in folklore, popular culture, as Bram Stoker's Dracula drew inspiration from Vlad the Impaler. The character of Count Dracula is often associated with this historical figure. Number 2. House of Sforza House of Sforza initially gained power in Milan through military prowess. Francesco Sforza, the founder of the dynasty, married Bianca Maria Visconti, an illegitimate daughter of the last Visconti du Duke of Milan, and seized control of the city. This military takeover raised questions about the legitimacy of their rule, as Galenzio Maria Sforza, son of Francesco, faced controversy during his rule due to his lavish lifestyle, patronage of the arts, and alleged of tyranny. His reign was marked by political intrigue, cruelty, and a focus on personal indulgence leading to both administration and criticism. But then Galizio Maria Sforza was assassinated in 1476, allegedly by his conspirators by his own court. The circumstances surrounding his assassination and identities of the perpetrators are subjects of historical debate. Some believe that his own relatives were involved with the plot, as Ludovico Sforza, also known as Ludovico Il Moro, usurped power from his nephew, whom he had previously served as regent. And the Sforza family was known for its intricate political maneuvers, forming alliances with various Italian states and European powers. These alliances sometimes led to conflicts and controversies as the family navigated the complex web of renaissance diplomacy. And finally at number 1, the Habsburgs. Habsburg's family has expanded as one of the longest reigning as well as one of their two branches, both Spanish and Dutch relations. This family is the most evil as they use their political powers and means to control so many countries around the world. Countries that still hold their colonial rule in their culture, food, language, and in some cases their name. Philip II of Spain, a member of the Habsburg dynasty, was a staunch supporter of the Catholic Church and the Spanish Inquisition. The Inquisition was responsible for persecuting heretics and religious deniers and its methods were brutal and controversial. Maximilian I, Holy Roman Empire and member of the Habsburg family, dealt harshly with the Anabaptists during the German Peasants' War. He ordered the execution of Anabaptist leaders, contributing to religious tensions in the Holy Roman Empire. And Ferdinand II, Habsburg ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, played a central role in the Thirty Year 
war. His policies aimed at recatholizing areas that had adopted Protestantism led to widespread conflict, destruction, and loss of life. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian Hungarian War, was a key trigger for the World War I. The subsequent action of the Habsburgs led Austrian Hungarian Empire and issuing an ultimatum to Serbia and entering the war had profound and far reaching consequences. As his family ties into so many conflicts in war as a result of loss of life, is why they're number one due to their obsession in this era as time of expansion of land and rulership and religion. Number 10, the Borgias. The Borgia family, originating from Spain, rose to prominence during the Italian Renaissance in the late 15th century. The family played a significant role in both escalating political affairs and they are often associated with intrigue, political maneuvering, and accusations of corruption. Rodrigo Borgia, who became Pope Alexander VI in 1492, is one of the most well known members of the Borgia family. His papacy was marked by accusation of nepotism, corruption, and political scheming. Cesar Borgia, the son of the Pope, was a key figure in the family's political ambitions. He served as a military commander and played a role in the complex power struggles of the Renaissance Italy. Lucrezia Borgia, the daughter of the Pope, used her marriages as a strategic polloi and was even accused in involving with poisons. The Borgia family faced numerous accusations, including alleged bribery, simony, and immoral behavior. Some historical accounts suggest that they even used their influence in the papacy for personal gain. Of course, that's pretty not surprising. The Borgia family's legacy had been subjected with fascination and controversy. Various historical and fictional works include books, television series, and films have depicted the Borgias as often emphasizing their political maneuvering, ambition, and alleged moral fa failings. Number 9. Merovorgians One historical debate revolves around the question of why the Merovorgian kings experienced a decline in their authority. Some historians argue that the internal strife, weak leadership, and the rise of powerful noble families and mayors of the palace contributed to the decay of royal power. Others suggest that the kings intentionally adopted a more symbolic role while real power shifted in regional leaders. The role of women in this political family was a society in an era of historical interest and debate. Some historians argue that the Mavorgian queens such as Brunhilde and Fergagun played a significant role in political affairs and intrigue while others emphasize the limitation imposed on women in that societal context. Like in many historical dynasties, the Mavorgians faced disputes over succession which sometimes led to violence and internal conflicts. The lack of a clear and consistent system of succession contributed to their instability. Number 8. House of Plantagenet The House of Plantagenet, a royal house that ruled in England from the 12th to the 15th century, was marked by several controversies and events. One of the early controversies was involved of a sudden death of Thomas Becket, a Archbishop of Canterbury, in 1170. Becket and the King Henry II had a conflict over the authority of the church, and Becket's death in the Canterbury Cathedral led to a significant tension between the crown and the church. King John faced a rebellion by his barons due to perceived control of power, and in 1215, he reluctantly signed the Magna Carta, a document that aimed to limiting the king's power and establishing certain legal protections for subjects. The signing of the Magna Carta is a landmark event in the development of constitutional principles, and Richard III, the last Pelagenic king, is often associated with the mysterious disappearance of his nephews, the young Edward V and his brother Richard. In the Tower of London, specifically was the last of their known place. The fate of the princes is a historical mystery, and Richard III has been accused of ordering their death. Number 7. Amputation While amputation was not a common punishment in Viking societies, there are historical accounts of it being used in extreme cases of punishment, which is absolutely crazy. I'll tell you two of them. One example is the story of Orm of Lyre, who was a wealthy farmer in Norway during the 11th century. Now Orm, old Orm here, he was accused of multiple killings, including the killing of a chieftain and was sentenced to have his hands and his feet amputated. Yeah, you can't kill anyone when you don't have any mitts. Apparently. This was a severe punishment that was reserved for the most serious of the most serious, and it was intended to permanently disable the offender and hopefully prevent them from committing further crimes. Example number two, Edvin Kniffri. He was a wealthy farmer, again, another farmer in rough times. He was a wealthy farmer in Iceland during the 10th century. Now, Edvin, he was accused of stealing cattle, and as a punishment, his nose and his ears were cut off. Do you hear that? That's Edvin's ears getting cut off. It's horrible. You can't show it, but I can definitely act it. This form of punishment was intended to publicly shame the offender and serve as a warning to others. Yeah, I see Edvin over there. Old non-ear Edvin. That's why you don't steal. Number six. Slavery. Slavery, of course, was a common practice in Viking or medieval societies, and it was often used as a punishment for crimes such as theft, piracy, and debt. As I said earlier, if you steal enough stuff, you owe people far too much. Now they own you. According to the Bjarki laws, a set of Viking era laws governed in you know, 832, I mentioned that earlier as well, individuals who were unable to pay their debts could 
and will be sold into slavery. Yeah, you gotta pay some way. Vikings also engaged in the slave trade. They captured individuals during these raids and they sold them as slaves in markets across Europe and the Middle East. Slavery was an integral part of the Viking economy and many Viking households had slaves actively who were performing various tasks such as farming, household chores, and even military service. The treatment of slaves in Viking societies varied depending on the individual owner, but slaves were generally considered property and had few legal rights. Yeah, we don't look at that often when we look at medieval history. We often just imagine guys like me with big beards, you know? Number five, the ordeal by fire. Also known as trial by fire, this one's a little bit different than being burned at the stake. Dare I say it's a bit worse? I don't know, it's certainly gonna last longer, which is worse in my opinion. This one here was a Viking punishment that involved subjecting the accused, this individual, to a test of endurance we can call it. They had to walk barefoot over hot coals or they had to hold hot iron in their bare hands. The belief here was that if the accused was innocent, they would be unharmed by this boiling hot fire. Whereas if they were guilty, well then, and only then, would they burn and suffer. This punishment was not unique to Vikings. It was used in various forms throughout history, medieval history. It was uh, it was huge in medieval Europe. They, they loved that. They loved uh, ordeal by fire, so that was a good time. Ancient India as well, they would perform such a task. However, there's some evidence to suggest that the Vikings may have used the ordeal by fire as a form of punishment and trial. For example, the Icelandic sagas, which are a collection of stories and history from medieval Iceland, they describe the use of ordeal by fire in legal proceedings, which Again, imagine being born in that era. Like, this is what you have to go and watch. I can't even watch UFC. I can't watch this guy burn, are you kidding me? In one story, a woman was accused of adultery and then she was forced to walk barefoot over hot coals as part of her trial. Yeah, she emerged unharmed and was declared innocent, believe it or not. I choose not to believe that. I believe her feet were absolutely fucked, but hey, who am I? Number four, getting even. Taking another's life, yeah. Can't get much worse than that, can it? Nowadays, if you kill somebody, it's a bit different. Now, you'll get out early with good behavior, and then Netflix will do four miniseries all about you. Yeah, nice, you get your own Netflix special. Love it. Back in the Bjarki laws in the medieval Viking era, taking another's life was considered one of the most serious crimes, and the punishment for doing so varied depending on the circumstances of the crime, but, well, it was all bad, wasn't it? Back then, if the killer was caught in the act, they could be killed well, on the spot, by the victim's family, or by the community. Over in 14 minutes flat, everyone goes home. No trial, nothing. If the killer was caught after the fact, they were typically subjected to a fine known as a wear guild, which was paid to the victim's family as compensation for the loss of their dearly loved one. And if the killer was unable to pay the fee, they could be subjected to other forms of punishment, including exile or even execution. Exile was brutal as well. You were declared an outlaw, then you were banished from Viking society with no legal protections or rights. This often led to you living in the wilderness, and that's terrifying, and that's lonely, and that lasts a while, and that's horrific. In some cases, the victim's family could also choose to enact vengeance on the murderer themselves rather than relying on the legal system. This could lead to a cycle of violence and revenge known as a blood feud that could last for generations. That's crazy. That sounds like it's something from a Batman comic. A cycle of revenge that could last generations. My God, let it go, Bruce. Number three, treason. Treason was defined broadly and it could include acts such as plotting against the king or queen, engaging in rebellion or insurrection, or providing aid to the enemy during wartime. Don't be a little snake, basically. Just don't do any of the above. The punishment for treason varied depending on the specific circumstances of the crime and which country it was committed. Now, this one's quite broad. You never know where you're gonna get, basically. In some cases, the punishment could be as bad as getting hanged or drawing and quartering, which which if you don't know, that would involve you being hung and then accused until nearly dead and then disemboweling them and cutting off their limbs before displaying the body parts publicly as a warning to others. So it's, yeah, it's the worst thing you've ever heard, pretty much. In other cases, the punishment for treason could include imprisonment, which is the most normal sounding thing on this list, banishment, or simply a fine. Yeah, here you go, I'm gonna write that for you. Don't do that again. In some cases, the accused might be given the opportunity to plea for mercy and be granted a lesser punishment. I would plea so hard. I'd be the most pleasant, hard pleading peasant in all the land. That would be over so quick, I would beg. The severity of the punishment for treason reflected the belief that the crime was a threat to the stability and security of the state. And you can't really fuck with that. Medieval society highly valued loyalty to the monarch and the state and acts of treason were seen as a direct challenge to all of this loyalty. So as a result, treason was punished harshly in order to deter others from committing anything similar. Yeah, don't f*** with medieval times anywhere, anytime, anyone, at all. 
period. Number two, rats. In medieval times, rats were often seen as a symbol of disease and filth, and they were blamed for the spread of epidemics such as, you know, the Black Death, stuff like that gross little hairballs. As a result, rats were sometimes used in punishments in order to deter others from committing crimes because, well, they're disgusting. Nobody wants that to happen to them, right? One common punishment was to tie a rat to a person's body, place a metal bucket over top, heat up said bucket so the rat is then forced to burrow into the victim's flesh to escape. Pretty horrible, but it gets worse. Other punishments involving rats included throwing rats at a person's face, which kind of hilarious, kind of horrible, or forcing them to eat a live rat. Both of these sound like fear factor challenges. That is insane. You get caught stealing now, you have to eat a rat. Can you imagine that? So gross. I would rather do the time than have a rat get hucked at my face. Thank you so much, Judge. And finally, number one, the cup bearer. We'll finish with one of the worst jobs to have in medieval times. This one's not a punishment per se, but it's too funny to leave out. This job would make me so anxious. Oh my gosh. In medieval times, a cup bearer was a highly trusted servant in a noble household or court. Now the cup bearer was responsible for the care and presentation of the lord or milady's beverages, ensuring that they were of high quality and served in appropriate vessels. Vessels where you can do this a lot. I know kings and queens like to do this a lot when they're giving their monologues. The cup bearer was also responsible for monitoring the lord or lady's health as their beverage could be laced with, you guessed it, poison. Yeah, gotta watch out for that, I hope. The cupbearer was often a position of great influence and power as they, of course, had access to the lord or lady at all times and could potentially use their position to manipulate history and gain favor with the ruling class. That would suck one day, wouldn't it? You take a sip and you're like, oh, that's actually poison. This one's my last shift. That really sucks. Didn't think that would happen today. At number 10, fashion. Back in the Dark Ages, fashion and high quality clothing were a symbol of status in society. For the elite, it was their way of displaying their wealth and high status over the poorer population. Because this meant so much to them, obviously they had to go above and beyond with their looks and oh boy oh boy, did they take things to a whole new level. Everything was super exaggerated. For women, they just wore the finest dresses, but for men, that's where things got spicy. Male fashion was quite something. They would often wear dangerously short tunics with tights and belts to really snatch their waist, followed by the codpiece to really accentuate things down under, you know? But their shoes. Don't even get me started on their shoes. They wore some seriously pointy shoes, and to them, the longer and pointier, the better. Their elf looking kicks were really what screamed, I'm better than you, to the rest of the public. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone to keep their shape. These people looked pretty ridiculous, at least to our modern standards, but back then, wearing pointy shoes and tunics with the codpiece was like the equivalent to wearing a full Gucci fit. At number nine, helmeted chickens. In the dark ages, peasants didn't really get the best food. The good stuff was more so saved for the members of the elite, and these people ate some good stuff. I mean, to us it's weird, but to them, it was finger licking good. Speaking of finger licking good though, let me tell you about one of their weirdest foods, helmeted chicken. No, it wasn't a special chicken that was prepared with special ingredients or whatever. It was literally what the name is, a helmeted chicken, AKA a chicken with a helmet on. I know, weird, right? This was a theatrical dish to say the least. It featured a regular old cooked chicken that was stitched to a pig like he was riding on its back, and to add a special little something something, the cooks would fashion a tiny helmet to make it look like a guard or knight for whatever lord or king that they were serving this bizarre dish to. This was a fan favorite because of how extravagant it was, but that trend sort of lived and died in the dark ages because you can't catch any chef doing something like that these days. Gordon Ramsay would have a fit over this one. Before I carry on telling you guys about all of the weird and crazy things that people did back in the dark ages, I would first like to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also consider subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number eight, beautiful death. Death was kind of a big deal in the dark ages. Sounds weird, but you also have to take into account the fact that the average life expectancy was only about 30 years old, so really, you didn't have long. 
Also, people back then were faced with some pretty harsh times like famine, cold, and of course, the Black Death. Because they had to face death so early on and so often, the so-called art of dying came to be. The whole premise behind the art of dying revolved around dying a good Christian death. According to those who lived in the Dark Ages, your death had to be planned and peaceful. When someone was on their deathbed, they would concern themselves with accepting their fate without quote, despair, disbelief, impatience, pride, or avarice, end quote. This art of dying thing was very popular amongst priests, and this actually led to a lot of painters at the time depicting people in holy professions as submissive to death and what was to come for them. You learned this story young! It's number 7, King John, aka the Magna Carta King, and one of the worst if not the worst King of England. John's offenses are almost too long to list. Even before he was king, the bugger was on some BS. When his older brother Richard the Lionheart was away on a crusade, John attempted to seize the throne by plotting with the King of France, Philip Augustus. Ironically, all those years later, when John is finally king, he starts his reign with the greatest dominion in Europe, England, large parts of Wales and Ireland, also Normandy, Brittany, Anjou, and Aquitaine. Yet within five years, he had lost all, almost all three continental territories to Philip Augustus. This loss of continental inheritance was an embarrassment and John was determined to win it back. Unfortunately, he was not competent at warfare and the attempts dragged on and drained the bank account. To quote Magna Carta.com, to raise the massive armies and fleet this enterprise would require, he wrung unprecedented sums of money from England. Taxes were suddenly demanded on an almost annual basis, nobles were charged gargantuan sums to inherit their lands, and the lands of the church were seized, and the Jews were imprisoned and tormented until they agreed to pay extra. John's reign saw the greatest financial exploitation of England since the Norman Conquest. In May of 1215, six months after the French whipped his butt, the people of England rebelled and seized London, with the capital held against him, the king's forced to negotiate and obliged to make concessions. The Magna Carta is signed. Then he had it annulled, and then everyone rebelled again, and then John died, and the barons were still rebelling. The end. Next up is William the Conqueror, and he's number six. Before we called him William the Conqueror, he was actually William the Bastard. Like something out of a movie, his nobleman father Robert came across his tanner mother washing clothes by the river and falls head over heels for her. As a result, the royal heir was not technically royal heir material, but don't let Robert or William hear you say that. Between the two, anyone who ever made fun of William's mother was killed and usually pretty brutally. An example is when the villagers of Alisson hung tanning hides in the trees to mock William's mother's status. William stormed the castle, captured 32 defenders, and had their hands and feet cut off. William, a duke far removed from royal lineage, didn't think too much about England until 1051 when the childless king Edward the Confessor made a truly bizarre decision. He chose William to be his heir. Then, seconds from death, in 1066 he revoked it. William decided no, I'm getting what I was promised. However, England was in a full blown crisis of succession for years until William defeated Harold II at the Battles of Hastings and became the new King of England. In wake of his victory, William ordered the harrying of the North. In order for the English population to understand its new state of affairs, he sent his men to the North to kill, unmask, and pillage stocks. This also made it easier to fulfill his promise of giving the land to his loyal followers. He then imposed new laws, raised taxes, and introduced harsh punishments against those who stepped out of line. The people of England were infuriated by William's new laws, and a series of revolts sprung up north of the country. In response, William and his armies attacked the northern villages, killing everyone in sight as well as the livestock and burning down barns. The lack of livestock led to starvation and disease for what rebels had survived, and the countryside started to reek of corpses. The total death toll, 10,000 people. Up the tower we go for number five. It's Richard III. Richard was never meant to be king, and the malign monarch only landed the job in 1483 because his brother, his brother Edward's children, were deemed too illegitimate for the role. With the support of the Duke of Buckingham, a great campaign promising to improve royal court management, and a stout disapproving of his brother's rampant public adultery, Richard seemed to have potential. But it's kind of hard to praise and look past the two nephews disappearing, however. In August of 1483, the supposed soon to be crowned King Edward and his younger brother, Richard of Shrewbury, were sent to the Tower of London to await Edward's alleged coronation. But his coronation never came, and one day they just disappear. The prince's uncle and would be king has long since been blamed for their disappearances and probable deaths. He had the most to gain, after all. Richard was also doing everything in his power to prevent the lineage going back to them in the first place, such as planning a marriage between Joanna of Portugal and Manuel, Duke of Beja. When that doesn't work, he tries offering up his niece Elizabeth, who 
At the time, rumors emerged that Richard was planning to marry himself. The room, this rumor more than possibly drove some to side with Richard's only remaining competition for the throne, Henry Tudor, the same man who defeats and kills Richard at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. On to number four, we have Siva de Polk the Accursed. Now, damn, that's a heavy name, but it's one well earned. I'll be more than honest, as usual, it's actually quite hard to judge if the medieval nobility of, of Kivan Ru were necessarily good or evil, as we know very little about them. And what we do know is word of mouth stories that survived for centuries before finally being chronicled. So we've all played the kids game telephone, I don't have to tell you how easily word of mouth stories can be converted and contorted. Siva Polk, the son of Vladimir the Grey who baptized Rus to Christianity, certainly had the worst publicity possible documented. He's infamous for the death of his three brothers, Boris Gleb and Svivoslav. Siva Polk's reign was relatively short one, from 1015 to 1019 because brother he hadn't gotten to, Yaroslav the Wise, took action against him. Then Prince of Novogod, Yaroslav defeated his brother, causing him to flee to Poland where his father-in-law was based. With his help, Siva Polk returned to defeat Yaroslav, causing him to flee back to the Novogod. It became a back and forth, taking turns driving each other away, and it was only in 1019 that Yaroslav won. Siva died at age 29, traveling back through Poland. Number three is Christian the Tyrant. His most notorious act was the Stockholm bloodbath of 1520, when after a three day coronation feast, he beheaded 82 nobles in the Swedish capital after promising them amnesty in return for intel. Up until this point, everything had been going his way. He had reunited the Kalmar Union under his rule, taking control of trade in the Baltic Sea, and married the sister of Charles the Holy Roman Emperor, joining the powerful Habsburg family. But as said by history professor Lars Bittelsgaard, Christian gained a lot of enemies in a very short time at the end of 1520. To quote, the bloodbath was a game changer. Partly it led to a rebellion in Sweden at the time when he didn't have any money left to pay for troops. Partly it was because the Danish nobility began to fear that they would see the same fate and lose their heads. In Denmark, Christian II had carried through a modernization program, limiting the power of nobility and strengthening his power as king. And when has the upper class ever liked having their sense of entitlement towards power tampered with? When Sweden started to break loose from the Kalmar Union, the Danish nobility lost patience, forcing Christian from the throne, driving him into exile and replacing him with his uncle. Not every ruler is ruling over a kingdom. Number two is John and the White Company. John Hawkwood led the White Company Knights Band that tormented the countryside of France, Italy, and Spain in the 14th century. We've done quite a few videos on this channel that explain how knights are kind of like labor or bodyguards for hire when there isn't some war or inquisition going on. Because medieval aristocrats like to disband their armies the moment they no longer need their services. During those times, the men would band up and ride out. As a result, hardened soldiers often found themselves at loose ends and many miles from their homelands. Since medieval armies fed and supplied themselves by pillaging farms and towns as they went, the mercenaries knew that was efficient, free, and easy for them to accomplish. So they continued in this practice. They roamed the countryside, robbing, violating people, and kidnapping random wealthy hostages for ransom. Of course, they were available for hire, but local landowners were more likely to pay them to simply go away. This is also why chivalry was invented, a code of behaviors and rules to govern these knights to stop their overall rampant and sociopathic behavior. Although Hawkwood, who in retirement would set himself up to be a respectable citizen in Florence, was known for his more insatiable greed than his brutality and thrived in this time as a freelance knight, he was the leader of a band that carried out the Robert Geneva kill order in Senea. And when two of his men were fighting over who would get to take a nun, he simply pulled a King Solomon and cut her in half. Problem solved. It's last, but that doesn't mean it's the least. Number one is the Vipers of Milan. Bernardo and Galeazzo Visconti jointly ruled Lombardy in what's modern day Italy. And their joint rule really is a testament for how this family really did do everything together. Everything. They succeeded for throne when they killed their older brother by stabbing him and their uncle Lucinio was killed by his wife. A plan she concocted while in the midst of a group intercourse get together on a river boat. Good thing for her, one of her multiple male partners was Galezio because she could just pop her head up and tell him the plans right then and there, call that triple tasking. Bernardo, the more ferocious of the two when it came to things that weren't adulterous, such as being in a state of perpetual war with the Pope, who tried to issue a bull of excommunication against him and Bernardo simply responded by forcing the messenger to literally eat it, including the silk cord and the seals of lead that bound it. Bernardo's lusts, by contrast, were unbounded. Has he ever heard the expression about not blaming the messenger. And speaking of Bernardo, watch out Nick Cannon 
because while he wasn't a riverboat share sash kind of guy, the dozens upon dozens of illegitimate offspring by his various mistresses outnumbered even the 17 children he somehow fathered with his very long suffering wife. Seriously, check out this guy's wiki page, it's the craziest list I have ever seen. Their most demented action, however, was the Quest Amira together. It's a 40 day torment method handbook that they wrote that would be used and distributed for wide, wide public usage, and it's the origin of plenty horrific methods that we saw used throughout the times. Yeah.